Please welcome the Executive Director of the Justice Teams Network, Kat Brooks. Well, good morning. I am going to start this the way I always start my talks, by saying their names. Repeat after me, please. Tamir Rice. Tamir. Yvette Henderson. Yvette. Rakia Boyd. Tamir. Jonathan Clark. Tamir. Sandra Bland. Shalim Tyndall, and so many more. My name is Kat Brooks. I am the executive director of the Justice Teams Network and the co-founder of the Anti-Police Terror Project. One, <laughs> 1,129 people were killed by law enforcement in 2017, and 778 have been killed so far in 2018. Police violence in America is an epidemic, a genocide, a genocide that many of us are complacent to, complacent by not responding with the fervor that matches the scale of the inhumanity. Hundreds and hundreds of people are gunned down every year, many of them unarmed, almost all of them of color, and the majority of them in the throes of mental health crisis. As a black woman in America, and as someone who has been doing this work for over a decade, working intimately with survivors of state violence, I've known for a long time that the devastating impacts of these deaths do not just land on the family and friends of the victim, they land on the entire community. Whether you knew the victim or not, and whether it happened in your neighborhood or not, or in a city you never heard of on the other side of the nation. For people of color, every time we hear a sibling was shot and killed by law enforcement, it lands like an uppercut to the gut. That could have been me, my partner, my child, my friend. But in today's America, there is no time to deal with that uppercut. Onward, we must go to school, to work, raising our children and taking care of our families, surviving by bearing the trauma as deeply as we can. We live with it. We give our children the talk. We are extraordinarily polite when we are pulled over, even when it's unjust. We do everything in our power to avoid and evade contact with police. In America, every day, there are entire swaths of human beings that take precautions just to not get killed by a group of people who took an oath to protect and to serve. In Anti-Police Terror Project's rapid response model, we have developed and incorporated practices for healing and community, vigils, support groups. We also believe that unapologetically telling our truth is healing. That is why we call it police terror and not police violence. The definition of terrorism is the unlawful use of violence and intimidation, especially against civilians in the pursuit of political aims. Police have a political aim, which is to enforce the status quo of race-based capitalism in this country. It is terrorism to know you could be killed at any moment just for being in your skin. It is terrorism to have your neighborhood infiltrated by an occupying army. It is terrorism when you get pulled over for failing to signal, and though you may have all of your paperwork straight, you are clear you may not make it out of the situation alive. Despite this daily live reality, we are told often and consistently that it's not that bad, that it's not a genocide, and a little more training for police should do the trick. For survivors of any kind of violence, having your reality denied is compounding trauma, on top of trauma. That is why Rupa's work, Dr. Rupa's work, is so important. She has used her, her positionality as a doctor and health worker to be not an ally, but an accomplice. To expand the work that so many of us are doing by framing police violence as a public health issue. To explore the ripple effect of our daily lived lives and how it intersects and exacerbates the inequities that people of color in this country face daily. It is groundbreaking work it is game-changing work, it is the next phase of the fight to eradicate state violence from communities of color and help to forge a pathway of healing for us all. Please join me in welcoming my friend, my comrade, my family, Dr. Rupa Maria. Give it up for the future mayor of Oakland, Kat Brooks. Yeah. That's right. Well, I first want to acknowledge the coastal Miwok and the beings on whose land we are meeting today. 
and to acknowledge all the indigenous people who have trusted me and shared deep conversations with me and influenced my understanding of what it means to be a healer and what exactly is the scope of my work. I want to acknowledge those killed by police and their families still fighting for justice and the UCSF Division of Hospital Medicine for supporting me in shaping a path that defines health and healing as broadly as I can imagine. And finally, I want to acknowledge my husband, Benjamin Farrer, revolutionary farmer whose love for the earth creates delicious bounty and whose daily support creates the space I need to do this work. Can I get my slides up? All right. Today, we are going to talk about decolonizing medicine. But first, I'm going to tell you a bit about who I am so you have an idea where my thoughts are coming from. This image is by artist Mona Carone from our forthcoming album, Growing Upwards, and it captures a good deal of who I am. I am the daughter of Punjabi immigrants who came to this country in 1973 with little money but plenty of caste privilege. We grew up with family vacations driving around a VW van around the western lands, and my father would stop at the reservations where he would make us get out and listen and learn and look and see what had happened to the original people of this land. He would talk to me about colonization because we are also a people who had been colonized by Europeans. I am a mother of two beautiful mixed heritage boys and I am a farmer's wife. I am a physician who works in adult medicine and who witnesses society's ills manifest in my patients' bodies and a doctor who sees racism and state violence as an, ur an urgent health public health issue. I am a touring musician who has played in 29 different countries, singing in five different languages with the band Rupa and the April Fishes. And to use a phrase taught to me by Miwok elder Wounded Knee, I am an earth person. What I'm gonna describe for you today is a system of domination in which we live and what I believe are the direct health consequences of that system for all of us. We begin with a description of how we come to understand disease in a modern post-industrial context. In the 1850s, the germ theory was developed, which described how organisms such as bacteria and viruses and such made us sick, which led to the development of antibiotics and vaccines and systems to, prevent the, um, to limit the spread of infectious disease. And then in the 1960s, with the elucidation of DNA, we entered the molecular genetic era, where we are today. Here, the gene creates a protein that can cause or protect from disease. How sick or well you are was thought to be preordained somehow by your genetics. This understanding has led to many powerful diagnostic tools and targeted therapies for specific diseases. And in 2004, with the discovery of the RAS gene mutation's role in the development of colon cancer, exactly 2,000 years after Roman physician Celsus described the cardinal signs of inflammation, we are entering the era of inflammation, where instead of a reductionist approach to understanding disease, we are seeing how many pathways lead to chronic inflammation, which in turn creates the conditions for illness. Today, we will be talking about the impact of social stressors, which have been shown to cause chronic inflammation. These diseases require more systemic approaches, not simply focusing on the individual, but rather moving our gaze to the structures of society, helping us see how the individual pursuit of health is actually futile in a system that makes health impossible. <clears throat> to understand the root causes of pathologies we see today, which impact all of us but affect black, brown, and poor people more intensely, we have to examine the foundations of this society, which began with colonization. To me, to be colonized means to be disconnected and disintegrated from our ancestry, from our earth, from our indigeneity, our earth-connected selves. We all come from earth-connected peoples, people who once lived in deep connections with the rhythms of nature. And I believe it is not a coincidence that the colonization of this land happened at the same time Europeans were burning hundreds of thousands of witches, those women who carried the traditional indigenous knowledge of the tribes of Europe. Colonization, 
It's true. <laughs> Colonization is the way the extractive economic system of capitalism came to this land, supported by systems of supremacy and domination, which are a necessary part to keep the wealth and power accumulated in the hands of the colonizers and ultimately their financiers. In what we now know as the United States, this system of supremacy is expressed in many ways and with many outcomes. But today we will focus on specific ones for the sake of time. First, white supremacy, which created a framework that legitimized slavery and genocide. Slavery created cheap labor, which is necessary for a functioning capitalist system, and genocide created unlimited access to resources in the form of land, animal parts, minerals, and raw materials, which are also necessary for a fully functioning capitalist economy. As capitalism functions, it further entrenches these systems of supremacy. Now, we all know that white supremacy is the scary guy with the swastika and the hood, right? But it can also look like any place where there is an abundance of white people in exclusive contexts, where power and access is not readily ceded to others. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Thank you. Please remember, lest you get caught up in a tsunami of guilty feelings, that as I talk about these things, I'm talking about systems of oppression that we are actually all a part of and that we all recreate. And these systems are what need to be dismantled. Back to colonization and its impact. There's white supremacy and then there's male supremacy, AKA patriarchy, which leads to, leads to the invisibilizing of women's labor. You know, like creating the entire human race out of our bodies. <clears throat> Yayo. <laughs> or in this context, reproducing the entire workforce and suppressing our wages, which further supports capitalism. Patriarchy also leads to femicide, domestic violence, and child abuse, which we see across all groups here. We also see human supremacy, where people feel superior to the rest of living entities, thereby subjecting, yep, thereby subjecting living soils, seeds, animals, plants, and water to horrific treatment in the name of exploiting resources, which in turn feeds the capitalist need for ever-increasing profits. Now, while this wheel of domination, exploitation, generation, and sequestration of wealth continues, we experience as the byproduct and common pathway trauma. And many studies show us that chronic stress and trauma create chronic inflammation. When we look at the top 10 causes of death in occupied Turtle Island, we see diseases that have been described to us as diseases of lifestyle, or ones that come about because of our poor choices. Maybe we eat too much fried food. Maybe we don't exercise enough. Maybe we have a genetic predisposition. What these diseases have in common in their pathogenesis is a component of inflammation. And we are just starting to parse out how the social stressors and the very structures of society contribute to and exacerbate this chronic inflammatory state. Now, it is short-sighted to see these diseases as caused by individual poor choices in the context of a genetic predisposition. I see them as diseases that are virtually impossible to avoid because of the system in which we live, which generates a biological milieu of inflammation through trauma, chronic stress, environmental degradation, and damaged food systems. I see these as diseases of colonization. Now, if you're a native person here, you're like, duh. Um, <laughs> You know, it takes science and medicine a long time to catch up with native knowledge. Um, so this is not news to native people. When I met Oglala Lakota elder Candace Ducheneau out in Standing Rock, she talked to me about how these diseases that are so common in modern society and more heavily so in Indian country are diseases that were brought by the colonizers. We talked about diabetes, which I had been taught in medical school is a disease of insulin resistance. Either your pancreas doesn't make enough insulin or your body's cells are not sensitive to the insulin, both ways of seeing things that are based in a sense of individualism and predetermination. On the Standing Rock Reservation, before the damming of Minnesota or the Missouri River, diabetes was rare. Actually, across Turtle Island, diabetes was virtually non-existent. Once the river was dammed and the cottonwood tree forests where people would forage for their food and medicines were destroyed. 
sorry, once the river was dammed, it ended up flooding these cottonwood forests. By shifting the ecology through a colonizing force, the people became more dependent on the cash economy for their food and medicine and lost the essential cultural connection to their traditional ways. This tragic loss of the commons is a hallmark of capitalist society and the impact is felt in the individual body. After the damming of the river, rates of diabetes skyrocketed, and this story is similar for all tribes all over Turtle Island. It is important to recognize this didn't happen simply become, because people became more sedentary and consequently more obese. This happened because of colonization, not by changing the indigenous body, but by changing the social structures around that body, which in turn creates disease. One powerful study from Alberta demonstrated that First Nations tribes that had maintained their cultural continuity, specifically through language, had lower rates of diabetes. So here you see the prevalence of diabetes, here you see the pe percentage of people who had indigenous language knowledge. Basically, if you spoke your language, you didn't have diabetes. Just imagine that, just imagine that. So this is what is protective. It's not the low carb paleo diet. It's not exercise. It's not the latest fad or trend. It show, this study also showed that self-determinism has a powerful protective effect from diabetes for indigenous people. These same factors had a protective effect against suicide for indigenous people in Canada who experienced rates two to five times the national average. This example to me demonstrates how disease is a complex manifestation of social and biological influences on groups of individuals that results in a common expression, here, diabetes. While we can understand this clearly from a Native American experience, we must be aware that these social structures of domination produce trauma and inflammation for all of us. We are all affected. So what can we do in, this face of, in, in, the, in face of this knowledge that can seem so overwhelming, that the system in which we live is actually making health impossible for most of us? Like the example before, simple things can have huge effects. To heal the diseases that are caused by the trauma of colonization, we must decolonize. If colonization represents a disintegration and a disconnection, we must reconnect. And our work is two-pronged, to reintegrate and to dismantle. We must reintegrate what has been divided and conquered in our societies, between our peoples, between us and the natural world around us and within ourselves. And we can do this in many ways, by promoting acts that increase local autonomy and self-determinism, by exposing the myth of treating the individual as limited in its ability to actually address root causes of diseases, by reconnecting to who we were before our respective colonization through songs, traditional knowledge, reawakening our food and medicine ways, and reawakening our relationships to each other, to the earth around us, and to other beings. And we must dismantle those systems of domination that create and recreate cycles of trauma and inflammation, those systems that work in service of capitalism. This is my vision of holistic healthcare. What does that look like for my work? How do I use my white coat privilege to address things systemically? Aside from starting to address diseases with my patients in the hospital as directly related to these phenomenon, I am doing these things. With regards to integration, I have been invited to help create a clinic and farm to develop the practice of decolonizing medicine at Standing Rock, together with tribal members and healers, Linda Black Elk and Luke Black Elk, great grandson of Black Elk Medicine Man. We have been developing a framework on how to offer care that centralizes Lakota cosmology and understanding of disease and health, and to create a model that can be replicable to other places and in other specific contexts. We have incredible partners, including Mass Design Group and National Nurses United, as well as the Do No Harm Coalition at UCSF, who are over 400 healthcare workers committed to ending system systems of oppression as a way of ensuring health for all. We have raised over a million dollars so far thanks to generous gifts from the Jenna and Michael King Foundation, Colin Kaepernick, and crowdfunding, and seek five million more to break ground on this exciting project. Yeah. 
With regards to dismantling systems of oppression, I have been working on a national study of the health effects of law enforcement violence or terrorism called the Justice Study. We were asked by the community who is fighting for justice for 26-year-old Mario Woods, who was gunned down by SFPD in 2016, to create a study that would answer this question. If the wound is police violence and the medicine is justice, what happens to our health when the medicine is not given? So we um, gathered a team together of public health workers and researchers, and we are currently actively compiling data. I encourage anyone to go and fill out the survey. It's online. It's called thejusticestudy.org. Um, we especially want to hear more from indigenous black and brown voices. So we are currently carrying, um, assembling data, and it's already illuminating, showing how many areas of people's lives are affected by police violence. We know that Native Americans, Black, and Latinx people experience disproportionate rates of police violence and can see that they are most impacted by the long-standing traumatic effects of violence. How does this reality contribute to the health, health disparities that we see? This slide also shows us how we are all affected by that violence. Across all races, we are being traumatized, with Black, Brown, and Indigenous being affected more intensely. We are continuing to collect data and will be offering it to policymakers who wish to shape community safety away from models that uphold white supremacist frameworks into ones that create safety and mitigate harm for all of us. What I want you to remember from this talk is this. Health is impossible when living in systems of oppression. We cannot effectively treat diseases like diabetes with a drug without addressing the systems that makes diabetes so prevalent. We must redefine the scope of healthcare workers and the work of healthcare to include not only care at the bedside of the individual, but dismantling the systems of oppression that create the conditions for illness. And finally, we must reintegrate with the earth, with each other, and within ourselves. We must decolonize. So what's next for me? I'm in the process of fleshing out these ideas in greater detail through co-authoring a book on these issues with writer and agroeconomist and diehard anti-capitalist Raj Patel. I'm going to continue fundraising and developing clinical methodologies in collaboration with Lakota Dakota people at the Miniwichoni Clinic and Farm. And I'll be continuing data collection, analysis, and reporting for the justice study, as well as fundraising for those efforts. Like many here, I don't get paid to do any of this important work, and I hope I can receive the support I need to do it to the best of my abilities. Finally, I will be finishing our forthcoming album, Growing Upward, which is a look into these issues from a musical perspective. Yeah. How do we, how do we heal from genocide as a culture? How do we help our native community heal as we work to stop ongoing colonial trauma? Because it is ongoing. How do we move forward in greater health if we have not healed the past? I want to close with a song about these questions called Stolen Land. It is my hope that perhaps one day we will sing this song together instead of the manifest destiny jingle, this land is your land, this land is my land, because it's not. I <laughs> I invite my bandmate, John Eikenseer, to join me. Take a walk with me through the redwood trees. A thousand years or more, oh, what they have seen. Like grizzly sitting here, just taking in the view. While the wind whispers songs, the alone Watch the water come down now from 
Whose footsteps walked here? Whose words will I never hear? Whose baby was born through the blood and tears? Fallen to the ground, silent in the shadows of sound, waiting to be heard. Yes, my heart breaks to pieces. This is how we are whole. Uncovering the memory in this place I call home. 